Uh, Joe, you have mentioned many times that when you started, in comics, you could kind of like let your hair down, and that also allowed you to make mistakes, uh, create, experiment, try different things, find what is not for you, and nobody was looking. That was something fantastic. And Mari, you start at the time of social media. Um, <laughs> I feel that every, every artist's work today are much more exposed. So I guess my question, do I have a question? Just a second. <laughs> so yeah, how does, how does the different circumstances or, or times inform your work? <laughs> well, actually, it started in the 90s, and so I didn't feel like I was being watched. Uh, and it wasn't until about 2011 that I, when my book first book came out, that mm -hmm. I got on social media specifically to try to start marketing myself. And um, wow, yeah, it's a completely different landscape. But I feel like social media is constantly changing, not just... Um, you know, the, the different modes of it, but how you use it and who's there. And, and I mean, it's just constantly shifting. So it's something that it's much like any kind of technology where you just have to constantly pay attention. And if you just bow out for a second, you're just going to fall behind, which mm -hmm. sometimes I feel like I'm doing, but then, you know, you catch up. Um, it's, it's of its own thing. I have friends who hire social media people just to do their social media for them, and mm -hmm. that sounds just wonderful. <laughs> Thinking about doing that. Yeah, I definitely come from a different world, I guess, um, and I'm very afraid to step into the new one. <laughs> um, you're, you're right. When I started out, um, the I realized, you know, on the one hand, my work wasn't selling. And, you know, I would, I would look at the sales of uh, the individual issues of Palestine, the first, I guess it wasn't the first comic I did, but um, the, when it was put into, uh, it was uh, serialized. And the sales, every, every uh, new issue had less sales than the one before it. So that by the final issue, it was selling less than 2,000 in North America. And um, it hurt in a way. Um, but on the other hand, like looking back on it, I realized because no one at all was paying attention, uh, with a very sort of provocative title like Palestine, now people would really pay attention, and they do. But at that moment, it sort of gave me the ability to find my own voice, mm -hmm. which was extremely important for me because I think, you know, knowing who I am, my personality, I think if I had to be formed under the present circumstances, uh, I'm not exactly sure how I would fare mm -hmm. if I was a younger person. Mm -hmm. Because I, uh, the things you say, I, I hear, I have cartoonist friends who are, are really, um, the criticism that can easily come to you on social media really has a big bearing in, in their lives. And so I, I avoid it completely. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean I don't want to uh, interact with people. It's just uh, I'm not sure about that particular format of interacting with people. Mm -hmm. Though the, the self-promotion, the necess necessities of uh, promoting, um, I know that's also important. And social media has been really good for people who um, um, don't have a lot of access. I mean, you can build up a following, obviously. And I guess I miss that, but uh, I, I think I'm established enough that I don't have to worry about it. Those are my own circumstances. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're okay. <laughs> <laughs> At this point. I do tell people, like young cartoonists who are feeling the weight of all the eyes on them, um, well, don't, don't look at the comments. Or mm -hmm. if you get a bad one, just block it. Or if, mm -hmm. if, or if you feel like you made a mistake putting something out or it's not getting a lot of views or people don't like it, just take it off. Like People aren't going to remember in a couple days True. Um, if you know, even they see it. And... A lot of people take it personally when they don't get a lot of likes. And it's like, mm -hmm. well, you know, just say it's the algorithm because it probably is. Like, stop taking it personally. Just put it online. Just do your, put your best stuff online. If it's not, you know, it doesn't do well, take it off. You know, just have your portfolio, but just keep working and stop paying attention. I know it's easier said than done, but it's, you know, that's kind of what you have to do to keep going so you're not mired in self-doubt mm -hmm. when you're doing that. 
Absolutely. But what about um, being in contact with with the people that follow you and the, and the people that read you? Like, does it shape your work ever? Or does it just help um, be in certain conversations to know what's going on and, and, and to be inspired to be in, or to go in this or that direction? I mean, I love it when people like my work. <laughs> I mean, that helps as well. But you get a lot of um, a lot of comments that just have nothing to do with you because mm -hmm. often when people are reading your work, I mean, hopefully they're getting what you intend them to get, but a lot of times they're just... Ref like, I mean, when you're putting something out in the world, you don't own it anymore, and you really see that in your reviews, especially when they're individuals' reviews like blogs and Goodreads and comments on the internet. You're like, oh, that's to do with you. That has nothing to do with me. Mm -hmm. For example, I have a book that's entirely about a long-term friendship um, that I have, and the two bad reviews I got, they weren't even bad. They were just kind of depressing um, where the people were just like, I don't get it, but I, I don't actually have any friends. And it just made me so sad for them. And I'm like, wow, that has nothing to do with my book. And um, also, I want, I want to go over to their houses and, and comfort them. <laughs> but like, it has nothing to do with me. And, and that's kind of something you have to keep telling yourself. Unless it's like a technical comment or you know, how you're doing something narratively or artistically. But like, no one ever comments on the stuff you want to hear about. <laughs> well, it's sort of interesting because... Um, Feedback came, came to you anyway, even in the olden days. Um, for example, the first issue of Palestine, and I got this from word of mouth. Someone, I don't even remember who, told me that they met a Palestinian playwright in the Bay Area who, who had the first issue and tore it up uh, without reading it because they saw the depictions of Arabs and just didn't like how I drew the Arabs. Mm -hmm. And then I heard something else about how... Uh, some Jewish people didn't like how I drew Jews. Uh -oh. And I sort of took it to heart. I, I looked at my work and I thought, okay, I can see what they're saying. I mean, I never really, I never trained as an artist, so I always drew <coughs> exaggerated features and it didn't bother me, but mm -hmm. obviously it bothered other people. And I realized, you know, if you're going to have a, if you're going to say something is journalism mm -hmm. or you're going to move in that direction, you have to you have to sort of think about these sorts of things. Absolutely. And so I try to draw over time more representationally, which is very, it's not natural to me mm -hmm. to this day. But in other words, a commentary came to you, even very sharp commentary, but it was invested commentary. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I wonder how invested the people are who are making attacks now are, it's just easy to make, Absolutely. you know, mm -hmm. attack. Joe, now, now that you were talking about how you drew uh, Palestinians or, or uh, Jews, uh, can you explain how you design a page? Your how process? I design a page? Yeah. Oh, okay, because I told you. Mm -hmm. Well, now my method, my method's really been refined, but uh, everything is built around the words. So once I've decided uh, how much of the script, which is pre-done, how much is going to be on one particular page... Um, I, I lay out two pages together, left and right, because uh, they inform each other, I think. There's a lot about peripheral vision that I think matters when you mm -hmm. open up a book. Um, but the words are, the, are sort of the crucial and beginning components. So what I do is I write the captions out, mm. the word balloons, whatever you want to call them. And then um, I, I write them on a piece of paper. I cut those out and I lay them on the page where I think it would look good for the eye to go. And then I sort of designed the drawings around where, I've, where I place the words. And the good thing about doing it that way, rather than penciling something and then erasing it, I can just sort of shift them around until I get it right. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of unusual. It, it just developed really um, organically, I guess. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting because one of the things that I've always thought that sets uh, comics apart from other media like cinema or like literature is uh, is, is collage it's collage quality mm -hmm. right and um, and Marie like your last book is all a collage what prompted you to to create I thought you loved me in this way what was your inspiration 
It was getting in an iPad. <laughs> <laughs> I've been playing with collages forever. But once I had the iPad, like, I mean, I, I we've talked a lot about this over the last few days. Like, I just have really creaky hands and probably arthritis. And it's really hard to cut out collage, let alone print up photos that you've done. Like, that's kind of a pain in the butt and the quality's not so nice. But now that I have an easy way to make collage that I just kind of went bonkers. Um, but I, I love that idea of moving it around on paper. I kind of do something similar with post-it notes. Mm. Um, narratively, I'll like put post-it notes, like how does this go? How does the story go? Um, but also like within the page. But in the new book, I ended up using the actual post-it notes and art on the post-it notes to indicate like when my brain was kind of cranking away and trying to figure things out. So I, I turned that corkboard into a metaphor. That's fantastic. That's super interesting. And um, this is a very broad question. I, was, I, I, did, um, I must say that I was kind of struggling all the time because you two are so different. <laughs> your, your styles, your topics, uh, the way you approach the medium. So, But this question is, I think... Um, general to almost all cartoonists, what elements of the language of comics do you see particularly um, convenient to deal with very problematic issues or um, sensitive topics? Like... <laughs> <laughs> Um, the fact of making certain realities visible mm -hmm. and the, or the use of drawing as compared to, for instance, photography or uh, the way we can, uh, in any page, juxtapose different realities, different times um, and see them all at the same time, Ma many times um, describing maybe a uh, traumatic situation, or um, Jorge was talking about how comics, uh, the language of comics sometimes um, might be especially fit to, to express the, um, the, the mnemonic processes, uh, remembering how we have images in our, in our heads and they're all just together and we try to create a narrative. I uh, think I answered my own question. <laughs> <laughs> well done. Um, uh, <laughs> well, uh, the thing I think, when I think about comics, the thing I think about, um, and I, I talked to uh, that earlier seminar, the first day I was here about this a bit, is that um, I, I feel like drawing is sort of a, a filter through which uh, people can look at, violent, at violence. Uh, it can be very difficult to look at violence in, in real time, in reality. It can be very difficult to look at violence in a documentary film. I mean, I'm, I'm very squeamish when it comes to seeing people writhing and dying in, in, on film in reality. Um, but a drawn image sort of allows the reader to look without perhaps that same voyeuristic connotation Mm. Um, and it's a filter, so the, uh, you know it's a drawing. It, it's sort of, you can be very precise about the violence you're drawing, and uh, the reader isn't hit over the head in that way. Now, the, there's a power of comics which I think can sometimes go too far in that, like a photographer, to, cap to capture some really violent image, it often has to be in the right place at the right time, Whereas someone who's drawing can always draw the, the, the right mortal moment. moment, the mortal moment. And that's sort of, that's why I often don't like a lot of superhero comics because they're always drawing the, the big explosion, the, the punch, mm. all that sort of stuff. So I think um, there's a, when I think of doing my own work, I always think of a little bit of a break, not to hit the reader over the head because mm -hmm. you can always draw that really brutal moment. Mm -hmm. You don't need to always draw that brutal moment. You can suggest it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the reader does more violence in between the panels in a way, you know, than you have to do on the page. There have been many times where I have really struggled with 
let's just call it the money shot, um, <laughs> where I'm like, how do I depict this? And it's not, you know, with violence or sex or whatever. It's something that's potentially really powerful or really emotional moment. And there have been a number of times where I've just struggled and struggled. And I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to keep that panel blank. And, and that was the answer. And it was much more powerful that way or, you know, just out of the frame or something like that. Um, I think that's very powerful because, yeah, that, that also bothers me about a lot of mainstream comics where, you know, you're just, it's bang, bang, bang and not a lot of subtlety. But I'm one of those people who loved the 70s for cinema where everything was slowly drawn out and there's so much pacing, like really slow pacing. Like I just really prefer movies like that. And um, I, th I guess I prefer my comics like that too. Mm -hmm. Mari, you, were, you are the creator fantastic creator of Cartoonies of Color, the database. And um, your talk was very powerful. Uh, oh. Thank you so much for such an <laughs> honest description, like an x-ray of the industry yeah. and uh, and the, the difficulties. Because I think that this profession, like all professions related to the art, are very glamorized. Yeah. And in the end, it's work. Joe, you have also mentioned many times how um, you consider that what you're doing is work in the sense that you've got your discipline, you have to draw maybe like two pages every five days or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, where I was going? Um, yeah, Mari, so, so in your depiction, one of the things that I like the most is the story of why you took action and created the, the Cartoonists of Color database. And I think that that is so important. Like to stress that these kinds of changes, the social changes, happen because somebody takes action and the importance of taking action it is and the true. importance also of finding a community. Yes. I feel like a lot of people, um, I've had a lot of very young people come up to me at conventions shocked that I'm the only person behind the databases. They're like, oh, I thought that was a whole organization. And I did. Really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. It's like just me ago. and some guy I pay to do, you know, the technical stuff behind the scenes. But yeah, it's, um, I don't know, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm a very, uh, I mean, I like to think of myself as an activist. Like if I see something going wrong, I'm usually the first person to step in on the street. That's probably how I'm going to die. Um, and I'm okay with that, honestly. Um, but I know this isn't your question, but I am actually really curious about, like, you actually put yourself in harm's way where I, I don't, unless you call it internet harm's way. Um, and I was curious how you get the guts to do that, or I don't know. Sorry, I, I totally derailed your question. <laughs> <laughs> but it's about community and activism, too, so I don't know. Um, I don't know if I, I, I can really answer that question. Um, <laughs> I, I think I was at some point, I, I, like the first trip to Palestine was sort of a big thing for me because I was actually scared to go, but I was living in Berlin at the time and it was relatively close and I really wanted to go. And I thought, if I don't do this, I'll really regret it. So mm -hmm. I sort of put myself in the future, in the future and said, what am I going to think of myself if I don't do this? Once I get an idea in my head, um, I kind of have to carry it through if it's if I feel it's a worthwhile idea that's kind of the that's the long and the short of that one mm -hmm. um oh, and over time I mean I was I'm scared a lot of times and also scared when I shouldn't have been scared and not scared when I should have been scared mm. but but you get you get used to things yeah. uh, in a way mm. but um you know it's funny because I've I don't to talk about the whole activism thing mm. because what you're like what you're doing with the database is extremely useful Now, do you, do you think of yourself as an activist, though? I mean, in a general sense? Yeah, I mean, in general, like just as a personality trait, maybe not in my everyday life. But in your work, I mean? I mean, yes, generally. I, I try not to bash people over the head with things, but like, I mean, my, my, my work is kind of my life. Wow, that's really sad. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> but like, I, I write about my life, so it's impossible At this point in time, and it's very sad, it's impossible to write about being queer without also being an activist. Like okay. you're, or, I mean, there, there are so many people who just hate me, who've never met me, um, and just because of who I am or the color of my skin or whatever, 
Um, I, and this was very apparent when the pandemic started and there was a lot of anti-Asian sentiment being thrown at me. For once, I was recognized as Asian in my life. <laughs> um, or just, you know, sometimes just the very act of being makes you an activist. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you write about your life and you're putting it out there and you, you know, suddenly have all these people sending you death threats for no reason other than what you look like or who you're attracted to or whatever. I mean, yes, so by that very nature, I'm an activist. Um, I guess, and also you write about, you are part of the community you're writing about. Sort of. I yeah. mostly sit at home and draw, <laughs> but kind of. Yeah, because, I mean, I guess I, I don't. I'm always writing about someone else, which is kind of a... But you're there. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and actually you were commenting before when you created Pay in the Land, how they were constantly advising you not to raise certain topics mm -hmm. uh, because you're an outsider, et cetera. So can you explain um, <coughs> how did you navigate that situation? Well, I think I navigated it by listening to taking to heart what was good advice and perhaps, unfortunately, taking to heart what might not have been a good, a good advice too mm -hmm. until I realized it wasn't. You know, you sort of separate the good advice from the bad advice mm -hmm. or the, let's say the advice that doesn't work for you. Because um, I, I, don't, I don't put myself in, I don't uh, break down myself as an academic might break down my work. You know, mm -hmm. it's like I, I sort of trust myself just as a human being. Mm -hmm. Um, to approach people. Sometimes I'm wrong and sometimes I get it wrong. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, I, I sort of give, my per, I give myself permission uh, to do things that sometimes, especially in, the, in a current moment, you're, you're told you'd be more careful, which is a good idea, mm -hmm. obviously, um, or you shouldn't do, you know. So I just let my, I don't listen to that. I have a, mm -hmm. I have a sort of a journalist's, mm -hmm. um, Sensibility. Uh, that's I studied that, and for some reason, that's what's in my head. Is like mm -hmm. I I'm allowed to do this. Is what I, mm -hmm. I tell myself. I might do it wrong. And um, we've commented this before, but are there any testimonies or spaces that you feel that you didn't have access to because you were an outsider or, be, or as a straight man or? Always. I mean, there's always places you can't go for various reasons. Um, in and in the life stories and testimonies. Oh, and, and testimonies also. Testimonies well, that you feel that uh, you didn't have so much, so much access to um, because you didn't feel comfortable or because they didn't feel comfortable with you? Well, you, those are, those are um, problems that you have to sort of overcome. Mm -hmm. um, in, in Gaza, a you know, female journalist I knew had access to both the men because a female... A journalist talking to a group of men is not a Westerner, is not a problem. And, and the female journalist can go into the kitchen and talk to the women. Whereas in some parts of Gaza, it's like you don't see the women in the house. I, I stayed at a house for 10 days and never saw the sisters or the, or the mother until I, until I overcome that and just said, can I meet your mother? Can I meet mm -hmm. your sisters? And then you, you meet them, they talk to you. It's, um, what's interesting is... Uh, places I've gone to, men often put themselves in front to talk because that's what they expect is, that's what's expected of them, they think. Mm -hmm. But when I, when I went to like southern Russia to do a story about um, Chechen refugees, I, in, I insisted on speaking only to the women. Mm -hmm. And that was very interesting because they never get asked questions. So they would ask, they would answer questions in a way that was really sort of refreshing and really truthful. Um, not trying to obscure anything or not starting with the, well, this started in 1400 and something and, and sort of work in, you know, they feel like they have to be, they didn't feel like they have to be representatives of something bigger. They just, they were able to talk about their own particular problem. Mm -hmm. Mari, you put so much of yourself in your work. Like, where do you draw the limit? And um, I'm constantly figuring that out, <laughs> actually. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of, uh, I mean, I've been doing this since the 90s and telling pretty much all my secrets, um, more to come. Um, <laughs> but I feel like sometimes, especially with memoir and especially when other people are involved, I've definitely made mistakes and, um, and then I learn from them and I dial mm -hmm. it back. Um, it's, yeah, it's an ever-evolving thing. And the problem is there's never a right answer. 
Um, so like someone could be okay with something one day and not okay with it the next and then okay with it the day after that. Um, I've had that happen like with my mom um, and other people. So like, I don't know. I, I try not to think about it too much. Um, I did want to mention like, I've been talking to other people about you because, you know, we're all talking about you and you just have such a disarming, kind nature that I, it totally makes sense that people would open their doors to you in ways that they wouldn't open their doors to other people. Um, That's kind of you to say. No, I'm, I'm completely serious. I was, I was very surprised when I met you. I'm like, wow, he's so warm. And like, that's, that's, this, this makes sense. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I actually have a question for you though. I mean, um, with your close friends and your intimates, is there ever a problem if, if, you're, if most of your work is autobiographical in nature, do you ever come, uh, do you ever have experiences where someone's gonna tell you, uh, is this gonna be in the comic? All the time. Okay. But I feel like more people tell me, this should be your comic, this should be your comic. <laughs> you need to write this book, you need okay. to be write that book. But, um, but yeah, sometimes, like if I'm going to write something personal about someone I'm close to or even someone I'm not very close to, I usually tell them beforehand and give them a chance to protest. And on a couple of occasions I've pulled it, especially if it's, you know, not really my secret to tell, but like I give people a heads up. I'm not I'm not a total jerk. <laughs> <laughs> and you also took some of your pages to uh to be reviewed by the people mm. who gave their testimony. Yeah, I mean for paying the land uh, mm-hmm. in particular, because I mean, I think that was a, that was some wise advice mm-hmm. uh, to send some of those images uh, back to the indigenous communities to see what they had to say about them. It, there's one scene where I tell a mythological story, mm-hmm. and I and I realize that might be really treading, uh, or or I might be trespassing there, mm-hmm. and I have to be careful. But I sent it to some people there. Um, and they said, yeah, it's great. You know, to them, it, they, they were so much easier. I, I, I had a lot of worries in my head that didn't need to be there, but, but it is good to, uh, when you can, um, make sure you're not going to step on someone's toes. It, it's, and sometimes it happens. You do step on people's toes sometimes. Have you ever had some setbacks on previous works that you would go back to the place, they would see the comic, and they would be like... You didn't include my testimony, or um, or why? Why did you? Um, why? Why didn't you draw this aspect of history that I told you that I consider so mm. relevant? Or okay, I can tell you one story. Uh, when I did the book about Garajda, mm-hmm. the first edition is different from the second edition as to one page because um, there was a doctor who was running the hospital there during the war. And he was interviewed by a lot of people uh, when journalists could finally get into the town. And I interviewed him also. And I depicted his stories. I depicted him um, at the doing some surgery and things like that. And he did do surgery. But later, after the war, because people don't tell you everything. Of course, they're not going to. They thought they, they might slip back into being an isolated uh, zone and that all the internal dynamics and politics would come back into play. Mm-hmm. So it turns out that he had been um, involved in all kinds of fraud, hoarding supplies, and um, I, I don't want to say selling them, but there was a whole investigation about him. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to sort of de-heroize him somehow. Uh-huh. So I redrew some of the pictures to show sort of an, an anonymous surgeon as opposed to him mm-hmm. uh, doing the work. That's interesting. You were going to say something, Mary? I do find that um, a lot of times the people that I will draw will be okay with something and then other people on their behalf will, not, not people who know them, but random people on the internet um, will get upset about how they were portrayed. And this, I think this happens a lot nowadays um, where people just get very outraged about things that have nothing to do with them, mm-hmm. um, regardless of how everyone else feels about it. Um, and that is actually something... But I think it's, um, that's one of the setbacks of having social media is you see things like that. And when you see someone criticizing and calling your work homophobic or something <laughs> um, or not empathetic or something, you know, just, just sending these really like painful criticisms, mm-hmm. at first you don't know who is criticizing you and then you dig into it and you're like, oh, who are you? But like when you first see the words, you're like, oh, no, I screwed up. 
So mm -hmm. um, that is one downfall of the internet and social media and why no one should actually read the comments. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, just my last question, and then I'll open the floor for everybody. Um, how do you see the relation between comics and academia? <laughs> Obviously, we are here in a conference about comics and... I actually enjoy hearing academic talks. It's um, when I can understand them. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> only accidentally. Um, no, I, 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 get, I get things out of them. I mean, I actually learn a lot. Um, sometimes I, I hear academic thoughts and I feel I'm sort of sheltered in a way in, in you know, my own little world. And then I was, wow, all these interesting things are going on. It makes me want to explore things. Sometimes I worry about what is going to be taught because I feel like academics shape, uh, they shape, like, uh, for lack of a better term, the canon in a mm. way. And I hope, I would rather they shaped it in a way than students shaped it. Um, I worry that some things that are really important to American comics will be left off the table as offensive at times as they might be, like the American underground comics. Mm. Mm -hmm. Because they did shape a lot. They are part of a story. Um, and I, ho I, I hope, I, I just wonder about that, that side of academia. And I, and I, I hope uh, academics are brave enough to sort of hold a line. Mm -hmm. So I'm a high school dropout. Um, I just want to put that out here. <laughs> uh, so the whole teaching thing, especially with comics, it's very very out of my sphere, I should say. Um, I love, I was just actually telling Candida this earlier about how I'm, especially coming here, I'm just so grateful that there are people who are teaching comics and who are breaking things down. Um, I've definitely had academics tell me things about my work that I didn't even see, but once they said it, I'm like, oh, yes, that is your, you're peering into my soul. That's exactly what I meant, and I didn't know it. Um, I'm so grateful because I feel like academics are actually keeping the art there and pushing it forward. Um, now, much like um, a regular reader who's bringing their own stuff to the table or an interviewer or um, you know anyone who's writing about comics, well, let me just say, every time that anyone's ever written about me, there's always one error somewhere in the article. Just sometimes it's a very small error, sometimes it's a big error, sometimes I don't care, sometimes I do. Like one person I remember said I was influenced by manga. I was absolutely not influenced by manga just because I'm half Japanese, you know. So, so people bring their own things to the table. Um, and I know that teachers do this too. And, um, and I mean, it's inevitable because it's, it's hard not to. Um, the times that I've taught, I've done some, a little bit of teaching. I'm not really cut out for it. It's really hard work. I'm, you know, bless you all. Um, <laughs> uh, but the times that I've taught, I've really kept this in mind. And so whenever I teach a book, I try to reach out to the author and kind of give them a number of questions so that we could hear their side of the story, especially if it's something controversial, especially if it's something that was written a long time ago, like how do you feel about it today? What was your feedback? Um, and I would like to encourage academics to do this. Um, I mean, not that you should reach out to every author you're ever teaching. You know, I'd like to maybe pay them or something, but like for their time. But like, it, but like if it, if not, reaching out to them, like I'll read their interviews or something, just to get to know a little bit more about them rather than drawing my own conclusions, which I'm probably sure, I'm sure I probably have errors too. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're all one big family, <laughs> honestly. It's, it's part of the ecosystem of comics. And, you know, and I feel like if, if we didn't have it, then comics would be for the worse for it. Answering my own question, as an academic, uh, <laughs> I feel that, <laughs> I feel that um, that's true. There's people that make mistakes. I would say that maybe they didn't research enough and that's their job, is researching. <laughs> I would love to reach out to the artists. I think that artists have better things to do than to answer my emails, but I will try because like, I would love to talk to all of the artists that um, I uh, tackle. And, um, but I have to say, like, when a Will you answer my emails? Yeah, I would. And the thing is, when, I, when a teacher reaches out to me, I am far more likely to respond than a student 
because some teachers will just say, okay, here's your assignment. Um, reach out to an author. I, I get a lot of student emails really um, saying, can I ask so- you like a hundred questions? And like, I just get so much emails. I can't respond to all of them. I used to respond Obviously. to them. And I just want to discourage teachers from doing this because it's, you know, I am very busy, but when it's a teacher reaching out, I know that they're representing like 10 to 100 people. So it's like, it's a lot less of a heavy weight than a high schooler who, I'm sorry, they never thank you afterwards when you do the work. They never thank you. Um, whereas teachers like might send you like a Starbucks gift card or even just a thank you, you know, if you're doing mm-hmm. some work for them. Um, but yeah, I, I always answer teachers and librarians. I, I say this with all the admiration. I just think that you guys are very busy. I prefer you to be creating uh, your wonderful comics and to answer your, my email. So um, I will reach out to you. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> Please and, teach uh, my books. Yes. <laughs> And, uh, and and what you were mentioning, Joe, is, is so interesting and, and so important, the, the creation of the canon. And uh, we've discussed this before, how I, my experience is that uh, many times my students read the comics for the first time, read comics for the, for the first time in general. Mm-hmm. So, so I discovered comics like I discovered everything that I like just because, you know, it was there and I, I explored as much as I wanted to and uh, I found what I didn't like. I learned to read. I learned to create my taste, to just enjoy it, to share it. And that's like, here I am, you know. So I would love for my students to, to discover comics or literature or cinema in that way. But, um, yeah. But if they discover it, through a class, that's also welcome. And now, uh, anybody has questions? Wait, I have a question for Joe. Do, okay. do, do, how do you feel about people reaching out to you? Is it weird? Uh, no, uh, I don't think of it as weird. I mean, it, it can be time consuming, but um, I, I wish I was better at, you know, really keeping up on that sort of thing. But, um, because I think it's worthwhile doing. And I, I try my best, let's just say that. I try my best, because I, I, I generally really like, I'm, I'm glad there are people who read my work. Um, I, love, I love meeting them in person, because I really, I mean, you know, you work alone a lot, right? So it's kind of nice to talk to people who are really engaged in the work, as it is to, to talk to scholars who actually care about and actually have some enthusiasm for comics, which sometimes they, they re-inspire me to be enthusiastic mm. about comics. So that's always a good thing, too. So uh, I, I, I like feedback, basically. I just don't want it um, through social media, I think. Yeah. One thing I do, um, if I don't have time to respond to someone um, in, in the way that I would like, I, have a, I keep a link of all the interviews that I've done that, I, that turned out well, and I put them on my website, and I often will be like, I don't have time to respond to this, but here's a, like a thousand interviews you could look at that might help. That's smart. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> thanks guys. I, I seem to keep hogging the first question. So. Um, but thank you. Um, yeah, uh, I, I wanted to follow up actually on what you were saying, Joe, just now on the, um, it's something that's fueled a number of our conversations over the last couple of days is the, um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the way that the, that the, that the climate especially for material that, like the undergrounds, that is maybe challenging <coughs> contemporary sensibilities, and, and especially the way that, that our students can often you know, react um, uh, very strongly to this material, and, and, and rightly so, right? I think that so often those undergrounds were calculated precisely to, <laughs> to push you know, buttons, and pushing buttons is kind of a, means something different, I think, in 2023 than it did in 1969. So, um, that said, I think I, it, it is the job of, of academics to kind of maybe get, go, get into those zones of discomfort. But, but the question I was going to pose was like, you know, that it's not just academics. I think that, um, that it can be the, the job of artists to, um, to explore, comment on, critique, revive um, some of that, um, that spirit 
Um, and I'm particularly thinking of Art Spiegelman, where he got into a hell of a lot of trouble with that um, anti-Muslim cartoon that was published in that, um, in that uh, what is Dutch publication um, about 16 years ago. I don't, I don't remember any it was, uh, Art it was, Spiegelman's. Uh, yeah, it, it was these... Uh, these uh, the Danish per- cartoons, you mean? Yeah, yeah, the Danish oh, but, cartoons. But Art Spiegelman didn't do one of those. No, did he, he didn't do it, but he wrote about them. Yes, for, okay, for the right, New Yorker. in The New Yorker. That's right. So, in other words, it wasn't an academic necessarily who did that. It was right. somebody like Spiegelman who has a right. you know, recognizable profile. So I guess I was curious whether there's maybe... Um, I guess throwing it back to you guys, yeah, <laughs> whether yeah. maybe it's not just academics. Maybe you guys could also be doing this stuff. Uh, doing what exactly? Well, kind of like pushing the buttons. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I think that's true. I mean, um, and this is like a discussion I have with myself. I don't, I have not resolved this, but um, the the thing that allowed uh, for me finally to make a living was the graphic novel. When mm. comics were no longer in comic book shops, where people a lot of people didn't go into, <laughs> they were in bookstores, and um, it's created, a, you know, I think really made comics into. Uh, graphic novels into an art form um, that's quite different from what what it was when it was in the floppies, when they were floppies. But I think there's a certain tone that's also changed over time. It's it's that um, when they were floppies and when they were in a place where very select niche people were going to get the niche item, uh, it was possible to push the buttons. Once you're in a bookstore it's less likely, I think. So I agree. Actually, I think um, that, I think cartoonists have to come to terms with that. And though the underground represents a lot of things that we really should think, okay, that was a different time, different place. We can analyze, critique, criticize. But as far as um, pushing buttons, just having a button to push uh, is, is, is always, it's good to be reminded that Sometimes there is a button that should be pushed. I'd like to add that the zine world is still alive and thriving, um, where many, many buttons can be pushed. Um, I still publish zines. Um, I don't sell them anymore because I hate dealing with money, but I will go to conventions and just make one just for a convention and just hand them out to people um, just for fun. What, what kind of stuff is in the zines that's not in, like, you're a graphic novel. Everything. All right. All <laughs> Stuff right. that's not, um, that no one is going to want to buy. I mean, actually, this this last book that I published probably could have qualified, but it was too big, and I did find a publisher um, just because it's so weird. But, like, really weird stuff, really, you know, stuff that's that publishers wouldn't be interested in hmm. or stuff that, you know, might not fill 300 pages that, you know, when you... Actually, my dirty, dirty produce was initially a zine too, where I'm just like, well, no one's going to want this, but you know, here, here's some sexy cantaloupe, and um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, ultimately, it did make it into the mainstream. But at the time, I'm just like, this is fun, you know. I just want to do like six post its and just hand them out to people. So that's what I did. And um, but I mean, there's still a thriving, you know, you go to like zine fests and stuff and people are doing some pretty interesting things with um, things that might be just very queer or pornographic or just, just really out there, new thoughts. I mean, there's, it's out there. Um, it's not in bookstores. Mm, okay. All right, thank you guys again for, for being here. <clears throat> I have an anecdote and a question. Yay. Uh, you mentioned earlier about how uh, academics don't reach out to these authors and sort of collaborate more. So much of the study of comics is housed in literature departments where nine out of 10 professors are studying dead people. They just, I don't uh, think we have that impulse, right? Yeah. But that's what I think makes comics so exciting, right? There's a really living body of literature. Um, so events like this where we're all in the same ecosystem in the same room, which is fantastic. Uh, I thought what you said earlier about underground comics was really important, right? You can't erase that history. It's so foundational to where they are now, right? Uh, you can't wash it over. You need to, re- you know, if, if nothing else, for just, you know, for the purposes of memory. But I'm also interested about what's next, right? Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'm not asking you to speak for an entire community, of course, but have you talked about how the outform has transformed from floppies to graphic novels, uh, the sort of building of your databases? 
where would you like to see the comics community, if you want to call it that, go next? Like, what, what, what would you like to hope for the future? Or, or the opposite, what are you concerned with what's going to happen with the, with the comics community or the art form? I would like to let go of this scared feeling I have that um, people of color and queer people uh, are a fashion that, that's going to turn around, like fast fashion. Like I, I would like to see our stories more centered um, so that we don't have to write about trauma or we don't have to write about our race or ethnicity in order to just like exist in any way. Um, that I would really like that. I would like to see... Um, more stories by other marginalized people, like specifically, I feel like the disabled cartoonists um, or disabled stories, like we need more of those. I just want to see more variety. Um, I always want more variety. I want, I want people to just really mess with the form some more. And um, I mean, I, I love just really standard, like I, I love all comics really, except, well, I don't really love... Marvel, DC, I'm sorry. But I, I love, like, I'll, 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 you know, just all the different ways to make them. And, and that's not true. I actually liked Mariko Tamaki's Wonder Woman <laughs> and, and Starfire Daughter comic. But anyway, just, just more experimental um, stuff. Um, but I feel like when you go to these zine fests, you kind of see what's coming. It's kind of like when you go to Tokyo, you see how Americans are going to dress in, like, the next 10 years. Like, that's how zine fests are to comics. Um, <laughs> So, uh, you know, I, I feel like I can see into the future, and it's very exciting. Boy, I don't know if I have any real uh, comment on that. That's, that's a very interesting point. I, um, but um, I suppose I, I would like cartoonists to uh, address a lot of the social and political issues going on now, mm. um, but in a literary way, um, not in a didactic way. Um, sometimes I, I, I wonder if cartoonists read a lot of prose, like prose <laughs> fiction, and I sort of, I, I feel like I wish they did so they could learn how to write better um, because they can draw and they can do comics, but sometimes it's l missing a literary flair, you know, and I, I'd like that. It takes all kinds. I feel like there are a lot of literary. I mean, I love what Alison Bechtel does with, yeah, well, with their comics. Yeah, um, absolutely. For a very yeah. obvious example, but I mean, there there are a lot of people out there who are doing really exciting things. But I feel like there's just like a lot of really popular movies might just seem really basic and and silly to me. <laughs> but like a lot of people kind of need that in their lives. Okay, I could go I could go off on this, but like I I'll just say this like there was a period when the the world was starting to go to hell and not this last time but the time before <laughs> 2016 <laughs> where I was in the middle of writing a co writing and drawing a comic that I that was just frivolous. I was um you know, I've been writing about some heavy stuff for a while. I'm like, you know, what? I just want to do like a strip and it's called Asian Goth Punks Rule the World and it was based on some like fun hijinks I got into as a teenager, and it, but it was uh, fictionalized. It was this goth girl and this punk boy, and they, you know, get into trouble. They s s pickpocket some guy and go buy a bunch of leather jackets and stuff, and it was just, you know, just fun. It was, it was a punchline comics, and I just like, oh, wouldn't this be fun? But I started drawing it when I thought Hillary Clinton would win, and, mm -hmm. um, and then as, as I was hearing about, you know, my... It, Everything was going to hell, and I'm just, like, drawing these, but I'd already committed to it, and it was for the zine called Razor Cake Magazine, and, um, and just the whole time, I was just, like, existentially miserable. I'm like, how am I improving the world? I have a deadline, and I have to do these stupid comics that don't mean anything, and, and they're just fun, silly, frivolous, but I should be out there marching, but blah, blah, blah. Anyway, and, and there, was a, but there was a period of time where... I was realizing that um, even though I was I, I was doom scrolling basically, and um, and I realized the only times I was happy during the day at that point in time was when I was watching like the Great British Bake Off or I don't know just some something really light, and I and and that's when I kind of kind of well maybe I was just talking myself out of it, but realized like oh we actually need that we need the we frivolity, mm -hmm. we need the escapism, and it's not you know. 
I don't know. It, it, it's all important. So when I see the didactic stuff, I don't, I don't identify with it. I'm like, it's, I'm, I'm like, oh, okay, strong arm me into believing this or give me a moral to the story. I, like, I hate that kind of stuff. But like, some people really need it, and some people really, it helps people. And, and this is what I try to tell myself when I see a piece of art that doesn't resonate with me. I'm like, well, that's going to resonate with someone. And maybe that's what they need to enter into the realm of comics, and then maybe they will, like, grow on to, to like other things. Like when someone tells me that one of my books is the first comic that they read and they're really excited to read comics, I'm like, oh, you're going to grow out of me really fast. <laughs> like that's the first thing I think. I'm like, oh, thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> well, that's a fair point. <laughs> comics are for everyone. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> but I kind of, I agree with you, but no, also I'm trying to... I, I want to come back to um, Esther's question because I think, you know, there's a lot of academics in the room and we need to be, I think, really self-conscious about our field and how we're building it and what gets canonized. And just in your last point, I told you, Mary Naomi, that when I gave my students an autobiocomics option, one of them said, well, I haven't experienced any trauma, so how can I make an autobiocomic? And I think I'm as guilty of this as anyone in the room, but I think academia really gravitates to the, like, capital S serious comics. Mm -hmm. And and you're quite right that we do need to think about what that means for readers who might lose the sense of comics reading as pleasure, right? And so I, I always worry I'm taking the pleasure out by focusing on the serious, important stuff. Um, but I also want to, like, I hope that people who are here as we continue the conversation will think more about how we interact with artists. And, you know, I raised it as one of my ethical questions earlier. Like, I work on refugee comics, and some of the artists I'm working on are stuck in places they can't get out of because their passports have been taken. And so, you know, I support their patrons or do whatever I can. But I feel kind of vampiric as a scholar that I'm building a career no, on the work of people. No. no, but you know what I mean? So I think <laughs> what's exciting about comic studies as a field is that we can maybe move beyond that English department idea. You don't just work on dead people, but, you know, since the 1930s or 40s, the idea has been we work because we are the, the key to interpreting things for the rest of the public, like the professor philosopher king who must <laughs> interpret the meaning of the text, right? And that's what English departments have been built on. So, um, and we tell our students, I don't want you to guess what the, the author meant. That's the intentional fallacy. Mm -hmm. So don't go and read interviews. But I think it's really exciting to think about building and continuing to build this weird interdiscipline of comic studies with artists and have conversations and collaboratively build knowledge rather than being kind of afraid of uh, violating some academic norm by going to the <laughs> and saying, you know, what did you mean? So I just think that's really exciting and it's giving me something to think about. Oh, I do think um, to what you were saying about um, not letting go of the history of comics um, and also how, how scholars in, in comics should I think relate? Um, I think it's one job of a teacher, in my opinion, as an ex-teacher or occasional teacher, um, and as a cartoonist, is what I appreciate is when um, a teacher will put everything in context. So, like, you can't just show people an R. Crumb comic um, that's you know maybe offensive to everybody without putting it in the context context of the time. Like, this is what was happening. Um, you know, like the, like I've I've I think one of the first comics I ever wrote in the in 1998. This is very embarrassing to him. Uh, why am I admitting in this this in public? But where I said I don't. Here's a bunch of words I hate, and one of them was feminism. And um, but at the time I was very young, and my um, certain people had used that as a label in a negative way towards me, I feel completely obviously different about the word feminism now, but there was a period where I was struggling where I, I'd only heard it as an insult, so I didn't like the F word. Um, and like you just kind of have to look at like what was happening in 1998 um, in feminism, in the culture, um, just like I was saying to someone the other day, I was watching 16 Candles uh, for a podcast that, I'm, I'm gonna, that I guessed it on, and and, and now I look back and I'm like, wow, this was so offensive, this is so racist, this is so just rapey and horrible. But at the time, it didn't seem 
well, it didn't seem very racist to me because in the context of all the other movies that were happening in the 80s, Long Duck Dong was actually kind of the hero. He was having a good time in the movie. He wasn't, he wasn't someone who was constantly getting battered down. He didn't have trauma. He was having a good time. Whereas every time, other time you see Asians on screen, like I would just be like, oh, how are they going to squash us now? So <laughs> I don't know. It, but now watching it, I'm like, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God. But like... Context is so important, and I think that's really important for a teacher to relate to the students, if, especially if you're going to give something that's going to make the students cringe or you know have some kind of visceral reaction. Sorry for the ramble. <laughs> <laughs> um, here in Iowa, the state government is actively pursuing the book banning. There's a group the, from Florida, the Moms for Liberty or something, and they're actively looking to start banning books. And a quick research uh, showed that that Magic Fish book is, is on their oh, list um, that you were talking about earlier. Yeah. Um, so in the more. short term, these book burning, book banning things, did I say book burning? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Same difference. Um, it can, uh, there can be an immediate backlash now. It's like, you're going to go out and buy the book because, mm -hmm. hey, what's in this book that they want to ban it? <laughs> it's very good and, book. of course, the problem becomes in the long term. Do you guys have any <laughs> you can speak to experience this. with <clears throat> your books trying to get banned by the book banning people? I did talk about this in my uh, lecture yesterday, but one of my books got banned, and... Um, Instead of, I think, what normally happens when a book gets banned where, you know, it just quietly goes away and maybe so does the author, um, mine happened to get written about in the LA Times and it actually revived my career and um, it's why I'm still making comics right now, probably. Um, but yeah, banning sucks, even though, even though it helped me. I, I just think it's terrible. It, it puts the most marginalized people at risk. Um, I mean, The Magic Fish, that book is so wholesome and sweet. And, and the book that I got banned because it was too queer, it's not even queer. Book two and book three in that trilogy are queer. Book one isn't queer, and book one is the one they banned. She just found out that I was queer and decided to ban the book. I mean, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. It's just them, uh, what do you call it, uh, when they're just trying to trolling? I don't know. Anyway, I have I have a beef with her, Katie Texas. <laughs> Do you have anything to say about banned books? You know, I I haven't had uh, uh, a lot of experience with it. I know some stores haven't taken my books, and I mean, it's within the rights of the store owner, whatever I think about it, to say they don't want to sell it. They, I mean, there've been complaints where they pulled my books, but nothing overarching like that. <clears throat> so. Thank you so much for, for this great moment. And now it's time to say goodbye and to finish this wonderful Aww. conversation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. <laughs>